Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jakob Stoger Nilsson from the School of European Languages. It is my great pleasure on, the, on behalf of the organizers of the UCL Lunch Hour Lectures to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Helen Donahue. She's a microbiologist at the UCL Division of Infection and Immunity in the Faculty of Medical Sciences. Her talk today is entitled Bones, Mummies, Tuberculosis, and Ancient DNA. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate the invitation, especially as this is a curtain raiser for World TB Day, which will be next Thursday. And there's many events going on next week about modern TB. And, but today I'm talking about historical TB and trying to work out uh, where it came from originally. So starting off with modern TB, the World Health Organization estimates that one third of the global population is infected with the bacterium that causes tuberculosis, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, or MTB. But the great majority of these infections are latent. That means that people are infected but don't show any symptoms. They can develop symptoms if they become more susceptible. So if their immunity is depressed, the very young and the very old especially. Tuberculosis is a disease of the lungs and it's spread by infectious aerosols. And so you get more tuberculosis where you have a densely populated uh, site such as London. In fact, London is described today as the European TB capital. So that's a combination of the fact that it's a very large, densely populated city. We have people from many parts of the world, uh, and some of those places have high levels of tuberculosis, but we also have areas where there's a lot of poverty, we have rough sleepers, and that's another group where we have a lot of active tuberculosis. Now, if you look at large cities around the world, London, San Francisco, and here we have Montreal in Canada, and we have Montreal, the big green dot there. If you analyze the origins of the population of these international cities, and you work out what strain of MTB these people are carrying, you find overall people are more likely to be infected with the strain of MTB associated with their ethnic origin and where their ancestors came from. So you can see here we have the Pacific Rim, we have China, the former uh, Soviet republics, we have South and North India, West Africa. And so in a city like Montreal or London, people who, with those origins or their family origins tend to harbour, if you like, their local strain. And we interpret that as evidence that we have co-evolved with these bacteria over a very long period of time. And I've already mentioned the importance of the density of population because of the infection being spread by infectious aerosols generated from the lung. Now, if we think back to what we know about the Neolithic era, or perhaps even uh, the Paleolithic era, our ancestors were not living in dense cities. They were generally in small hunting groups, family groups, mobile groups. And under those conditions, if the MTB was very virulent, it would kill its hosts and it would itself die out. And so because we have this 
coexistence and such a high level of latency, we interpret this as evidence that where well, we had small population sizes, there was positive selection for strains of these pathogenic organisms that could persist until they had a chance to get passed on. So in the pre-antibiotic era, we used to talk about the grandparent syndrome. In the 1940s and 50s, it was a recognised scenario that grandparents looking after grandchildren in extreme old age, less uh, control over latent tuberculosis, it can re-emerge late in life. An infant has an immature immune system, it can more readily acquire it. So we think that might be the scenario of what was going on in the past eras. Another way of showing what we think has been happening is that we assume the origin of the bacteria that caused tuberculosis a long, long time ago emerged from environmental bacteria. There are many environmental species of mycobacteria. But at some point, a clone of these bacteria adapted to uh, growing in humans and MTB is now an obligate pathogen. It does not grow in the environment. You can get infections in other animals, but you don't find mycobacteria and tuberculosis alive and growing in the environment. And so we call this slimming down to occupy a particular ecological niche, we call that an evolutionary bottleneck. So we think these bacteria went through an evolutionary bottleneck and then we got our separate clones of human populations evolving and we have clonal descent, clonal expansion. So you have different human populations around the world with their own local strain of MTB. And in fact, because of that, just by finding out uh, what type of TB is present in a population in the past, it can tell us about human migrations. We can learn about what humans were up to by looking at their infectious pathogens. Now, paleopathology, as you can gather from the name, it's the pathology of ancient bones. And we can, uh, there are specialists in this. Normally, they come via archaeology or medical anthropology. Very often, retired pathologists take up paleopathology. And we can study past infectious diseases and other medical conditions. So on the left, we have an illustration of somebody who had very badly fractured long bones, but you can see it's healed, the individual survived, but it's very badly aligned, not aligned at all, so the person would have been partially crippled by this happening. In the centre, we have the skull of an individual with leprosy. Leprosy is caused by another related bacterium, Mycobacterium leprae, that I've worked on quite a lot. And the thing about leprosy is it's a disease of nerves. And here in the picture, you can see we have rounding and enlargement of the nasal cavity and changes in the upper jaw, the loss of all the teeth, and eventually the palate is destroyed. So if you look at that, you are fairly certain that you have a case of leprosy, but be careful, there's another disease that causes something similar, and that is syphilis. So it's not quite straightforward. Here, this picture is an 18th century naturally mummified individual, and 
I'll be talking about these 18th century Hungarian mummies in a minute. Uh, but this individual, he was a lad of about 18 years old. We know his name, his family, the uh, date of his death, the date and age at death of his parents. He died about three months after his father died. His mother died about six months before that. And looking at his legs, uh, the paleopathologists concluded that his spinal cord was damaged and he's, he was quadriplegic. He had no sensation below the waist. And that is typical Pott's disease that was recognised many years ago. Paleomicrobiology is what we call the study of ancient uh, microbial infections. And because we are surrounded by microorganisms in our modern environment. There's a great problem in avoiding contamination when we're looking for old microorganisms. So we try to use more than one method of detecting them. So I've been talking about morphological analysis. Imaging is important. Originally, radiographs, x-rays, more recently, CT scans, micro-CT scans. Trouble with that is, micro-CT scans destroy ancient DNA, so we're not so keen on that. And histology, where you, have, you look at sections and you look under the microscope and you can sometimes find direct evidence of microorganisms in tissues that shouldn't have them. Uh, we also look at other biomarkers, and we've uh, collaborated for many years now with a group of organic chemists who look at cell wall lipids that are typical, unique to the particular species of bacteria we're looking for. We also can look at ancient proteins, and there's a modern way of analysing these, uh, on a, looking at all proteins in a sample known as proteomics. We've just had a paper published where we tried using this method with our collaborators, but unfortunately it's not really very specific. It's very difficult to prove you've got a particular infection if you're looking at proteins. So we honed in on ancient DNA analysis, and this all became possible because of the uh, development of the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, that uh, most people nowadays have heard of, even though they're not uh, into ancient DNA or biologists. More recent techniques are capture of the DNA uh, by hybridization, next generation sequencing, and whole generation, uh, genome sequencing, uh, WGS. So we've just tipped our toes into that. Now, the very first study to show this was possible was carried out at UCL, and the very first paper was published in 1993. And my still long-term collaborator, Professor Mark Spiegelman, he is a retired medic who retired in his 50s and registered as an undergraduate student in the Institute of Archaeology. I don't think they let people do that nowadays, but... He managed to register, and in his third year, his final year project, he came up with the idea that ancient DNA was the new hot topic. He was a retired medic. He had lots of money. He had gone all around the world to the really interesting, up-to-date conferences. He knew everybody was getting excited about ancient DNA. He thought about ancient DNA of infectious bacteria. And being a medic, he came up with one of the best infections, the best bacterium to look for, and that was mycobacterium tuberculosis. And I hope you'll see why it was such a good choice as we go through this lecture. Now, being a medic, he didn't do the work himself. He came and talked to our head of department who assigned him a completing PhD student, Ishetu Lemma from Ethiopia. And Ishetu was the one who worked out the method of extraction and decided the best target. 
and he was crucial in the success of this. And actually, he went back to Addis Ababa and had a very successful career. He got our whole department molecular. And he chose PCR, and uh, there's a little uh, visual showing that. And what PCR does, it enables you to target a very specific part of the DNA, and you can copy it repetitively and end up with billions of copies, so many, you can actually see the specific DNA on a gel if you look at it under a UV light. And this is, uh, I don't actually use Roche, but they have a very nice diagram here uh, showing PCR where you have a double-stranded uh, DNA, a forward and reverse sequence. You heat it to separate the sequence. You put in little primers that will bind to the opposite ends of the two pairs. You have a mixture with all the ingredients for making more DNA and you just repeat the heating and cooling sample over and over again till you end up with millions, billions of copies. That's what made all this work possible. So the strategy we followed, um, when our PhD student went back home, uh, I picked up the, uh, the task of carrying this work forward. Having told Mark Spiegelman, I thought it was a total waste of time and would never work. I had to eat my words. So I carried on and our strategy was to target specific regions in the MTB genome, especially those where we had lots of copies of the same marker. And that would increase our chance of getting a positive result. Originally, we use agarose gels. Uh, now we use specific primers with fluorescent probes. And you can see it all as the reaction happens in a real-time PCR reaction. And uh, we can also analyze um, de deletions and polymorphisms that will enable us to identify different types of DNA. Now, ancient DNA is very fragmented. It's not a very stable molecule. Its stability is entirely determined by the local environmental conditions, not by the actual age of the sample. So, for instance, I, at the end, I hope I get to talking about some 9,000-year-old TB, but I've recently been working on some mid-Victorian TB from the Crossbone site in Southwark with people from the Museum of London, and that is one of the worst places for DNA preservation. If you think about the British climate, it is, if you wanted to get rid of any DNA going, it would be our climate. So you can't look at the extent of preservation and say that tells you it's that old. It all depends on the local situation. This shows you what real-time PCR looks like, and you have exponential increase in your target DNA you can calibrate it and work out how much is there if you standardize it. Now, why bother to study ancient microbial pathogens? Well, I just happen to think it's intrinsically interesting and I'd like to do it anyway, but there are definite reasons why it's good to do it. Uh, if you're a paleopathologist, you can suspect that a particular disease caused uh, a lesion on a bone, but if you find DNA from the causative organism, that proves it. But there are many situations, many skeletons, many mummified individuals where you've got no signs of any lesions at all. This caused a lot of problems when we got going because we were finding lots of tuberculosis in bones with no lesions. That's because the paleopathologists, they've been brought up to look for lesions. Us microbiologists know that TB is a disease mainly of lungs. It only gets into the bones. If it gets into the bloodstream, bloodstream goes all around the body and ends up in a bone, and then the patient lives long enough for a lesion to develop. You only get about 5% of cases of active untreated TB that have got bony lesions. You can answer historical questions. 
was there tuberculosis in the Americas before Colombo and other Europeans got there? Well, we now know since 2013 that the answer is yes. There's still a great deal of debate going on about whether the type of TB that was found is typical or a one-off, because it's associated with seals and seems a bit unusual. But anyway, you can answer historical questions. The other thing you can do is detect co-infections with mixtures of different organisms. And you can also look at comorbidities. You can see whether tuberculosis is associated with cancer or uh, diseases such as rickets or scurvy. So you can look at comorbidities and co-infections. If you have a large enough group of individuals, you can do epidemiology. You can look at populations in the past. You can look directly at past populations instead of having to infer what may have happened by working backwards from what we know today. And I think the most important reasons for looking at ancient pathogens is because we can directly compare the past pathogens with those of today, and we can compare them in real time. We can say 300 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 9,000 years ago, it was like this. You don't have to do all this complicated back calculation of working out most recent common ancestors and inferring uh, what was happening earlier in time. We can look at changes in virulence, uh, what proportion of people lived or died with the disease, and it can tell us about the development of the relationship between the host and the pathogen. So, on the left, we have a typical example of a spine from somebody who had Potts disease. If you see this, even without any ancient DNA, it tells you there was tuberculosis present. You can find this in ancient Egypt. You can find it in pre-Columbian America, in the Incas, for example. So it's direct proof of tuberculosis existing. In the center, we have a spine where we've got some fusion of the vertebrae and we've got what's called a cold or chronic abscess. Now, this is probably caused by tuberculosis, but it's not certain. Most confusing of all is where we have what's called periostitis. This is new bone formation. It's looser and it forms at sites where you have chronic inflammation. Now, in the past, there was a lot of tuberculosis, and so it's highly likely much of this periostitis is caused by tuberculosis. But there were many arguments raging about whether periostitis indicated tuberculosis when the ancient DNA work started. Here's a, a case of ancient Egyptian tuberculosis that I was involved in studying. This is Dr. Granville's Egyptian mummy. Dr. Granville was a very fashionable physician in the Regency period. There was a great interest in everything Egyptian after Bonaparte's war in that area. And it was a favourite after dinner pastime of gentlemen to unwrap mummies. Dr. Granville was a physician and he conducted the first ever scientific autopsy of an Egyptian mummy. And this was published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of London in 1825. And these are the original etchings from that publication that was republished in our later follow-up study. We can't go back to the originals because Dr. Granville did a destructive autopsy all we have left is a little wooden box with a few bits of tissue in. However, uh, he described what he thought was ovarian cancer. He was a gynaecologist and 
We all know that doctors tend to find the thing that they're particularly interested in working on. And uh, more recently, uh, it was re-examined and discovered to be a benign cyst. But at that time, having relocated this wooden box that had got lost in the basement of the British Museum, uh, we were allowed to look at some tissues from lung and also the femur. And here's an agarose gel. And here we have our specific band of targeted DNA. And here we have the sequence that shows, yes, indeed, it was MTB. But to be sure, we got our collaborators to confirm it using a totally different method. So the mycobacteria have a very complex hydrophobic lipid rich cell wall. So the basic layout is shown here and these orange balloon of things are indicating mycolic acids. My colleagues in Birmingham have developed a very sensitive way of directly detecting specific mycolic acids that are unique to MTB. And here we have the profiles. So we have an original uh, sample of lung, uh, a new sample, and from femur. And run separately, we have a standard strain of MTB. And we can see we've got identical peaks. And so this takes our knowledge of TB back 2,650 years. This was the Ptolemaic period of ancient Egypt. I said that we could also identify co-infections and comorbidities. Here are some of the papers that demonstrate this. I said I'd been working a lot on leprosy. And looking at leprosy from Hungary, uh, from the 7th to 11th century, we found several cases where these individuals had tuberculosis as well. You wouldn't find that unless you were capable of doing the molecular analysis. It's highly likely that tuberculosis is the cause of death in untreated leprosy patients. In the early uh, era of medical bacteriology, in 1895, Hansen, uh, who did a great deal of work on leprosy, and the Norwegian fishermen were, had leprosy very badly at that time. He said the greatest cause of death of his leprosy patients in the Oslo hospital were caused by tuberculosis. Tuberculosis kills more quickly than leprosy does. Leprosy, you just start mouldering away and your nose disappears, your fingers and toes get resorbed, you lose your thumb, you lose sensation in the extremities, but it takes a long time to die. TB will kill you quicker. We've done some preliminary work that hasn't been properly published. This is just a conference paper that couldn't even spell properly. Uh, but we've been doing some work on some early Christian Nubian mummies from northern Sudan. And uh, we found, looking at bone marrow samples from these individuals, they had both tuberculosis and a parasite infection, leishmania, and this is spread by sand flies, and these live in acacia trees. And there's a room in the British Museum for Nubia, and they've got things like wooden door keys, wooden implements, wooden tools. They're made of acacia wood, so it all fits together very nicely. And here we have a case from the 18th century Hungarian mummies where we've got a case of leukaemia. A young child had Langerhans cell histiocytosis, and tuberculosis as well, died uh, in about age five or six. I mentioned the early Christian mummies from Nubia. These were part of a UNESCO rescue um, expedition uh, at the time when they were building the Aswan Dam because the site would have been flooded by the rise in the level of the Nile. And in fact, it was the universities of Kentucky and Colorado that did this, and we went to Boulder, Colorado to sample these individuals. 
Now, these were very simple burials. Uh, people were just buried in the hot sand. It's one of the hottest and driest places in the world. Hot is not good for DNA preservation. So it, you get a great deal of fragmentation. Uh, the adults tended to be skeletalized. No sign of TB at all. But if you look at these mummies and uh, the darker parts of the column are the numbers of individuals who we found evidence of TB in. So you can see across the age group, we've got evidence of tuberculosis. There was another study uh, done on these mummies uh, by a PhD student who was looking at fossilized feces known as coprolites. And uh, she analyzed the diet and showed that the women of childbearing age tended uh, to be anemic, uh, nutritionally stressed, and it was only men who had any sign of meat or fish in the diet. And so with a poor diet, you're more susceptible to tuberculosis. Now to the 18th century VATS mummies, we were so lucky to make contact with our long-term collaborators from the Natural History Museum in Budapest. Now, it was discovered in this small town of Vats, which is about an hour's journey north of Budapest or by train. Uh, the church was renovated in the early 1990s. There was a side chapel you can't quite see. And when they managed to get into it, it was all sealed up they found it was full of coffins, rather nicely decorated 18th century coffins with the names of individuals, um, the age and, and date of death. And here I should say that the Catholic Church, the priest, the townspeople who include direct descendants, they are very proud of their mummies. They're very happy to have a local museum there and they're very happy for us to do scientific work on them. That's not the case everywhere in the world, but we were lucky in Hungary. And we started off our study doing some basic things like radiographs, x-rays, and here we have a 37-year-old woman. We know her age and her details because there were archives. These are like gold dust. So we have archives, and we know that she had a deformed uh, vertebra. She was a nun and she was described as an excellent teacher. Here we have an unknown young man. His x-ray was full of little calcified lesions. We reckon he had disseminated tuberculosis. And here we have the oldest woman uh, in the crypt, uh, 95 years old. The only area that had any MTB was a little calcified lesion in her lung. We think she had latent TB. If you look at the whole population, you can see the greatest proportion of people with TB were those who died in their 50s. But you can see there were plenty of people over 70 years old who had TB and lived to a great age. This was a wealthy community in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, they were, um, if you like, they were aristocrats, they were factory owners, they were abbots, uh, people high up in the church. Uh, that they were not um, poor people. And that may be why so many of them lived to a great age, even though they were infected. There's a family group that was identified, a mother and two daughters who all died within four years of each other. Here is the older daughter. We know her name, Theresia Hausman. This is the notice of her death. It was all in Hungarian or 18th century church Latin, thanks to our Department of Latin for some translation. Um, this is what uh, MTB looks like under the microscope. This was from lungs of some of these individuals. And we showed by various genetic methods that it looked as though each member of this family had a different strain of MTB. And so we got our colleagues at the University of Warwick to do some, the latest method of whole genome sequencing using metagenomics. And very quickly, PCR 
we look for something in particular and the rest of the information is not looked at. With diagnostic metagenomics, you look at everything, every fragment of DNA is tagged, it's all sequenced, there's a great deal of complicated bioinformatic analysis, and you can find things you didn't know that you didn't know. So it's very valuable. We only did this study with about 15 to 20 milligrams of lung tissue. Uh, the people in Warwick didn't realise about ancient DNA being short. They just looked at DNA between 300 to 600 base pairs. Very lucky. Uh, luckily, the Hungarian mummies, some of it is preserved that well, but that was very unusual. So it was a fluke that it worked. And they used this particular kit, and it's all a bit specific, but we got a very good even spread of the DNA. And if you home in, this is looking at an MTB genome that was identified, we can find it looks as though there are particular regions in the mummy that were absent, a deletion. But further along the genome, it looked as though there were partial deletions. And that was interpreted as evidence of a mixed infection of different strains of MTB in the same person. And we got this in a letter in the New England Journal of Medicine. And we, we showed very definitely that we had MTB present and the interesting thing was that the closest modern strain to this 18th century, uh, two strains, was found in Germany, in Hamburg. Are we running out of time? OK. And so we followed that up, showing that we get a lot of different genomes in the same uh, population, including two or three at once. And the reason why that's really interesting is because we've just started finding it nowadays and we can show it was unrelated to antibiotics, unrelated to HIV because we got it before these existed. And I'm sorry I've run out of time, I was too interested earlier. But we've shown that there is um, 9,000 year old TB that was found in a Neolithic site in a mother and infant, and that was proved by DNA and lipid data. And uh, we showed that the domesticated animals were not the source of infection, but enabled a denser, larger population that supported uh, more people, and that was why you got TB. And finally, just something to leave you with is the fact that we have found evidence of MTB, DNA and lipids from a Pleistocene bison and also lipids from 40,000 year old mastodons. And so one theory is that these infections may have originated way back in time in the megafauna from the Pleistocene. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helen. That was fascinating. We have time for a very short question and a short answer. So if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, we have microphones wandering around here. So please wait for the microphone. Here comes, sir. Thank you. Why aerosols? Why not, um, not any, any, anything else? An aerosol is a specific um, well, collection of... In, in, in a drop? MTB is, is, if you like, it's evolved in such a way that it, it is very readily spread by aerosols. It's from the lungs. Uh, if people cough and splutter from the lungs, you get small particles. And because you have such a lipid-rich hydrophobic cell wall, the organisms survive in that in that environment, they remain alive for quite a long period of time. It's been estimated it could be perhaps as much as one to two weeks. And so that's the way it can spread. I'm afraid we have to make room for teaching. 
I want to thank you all for spending your lunch hour with us, and please join me in thanking Helen Donahue for a fascinating lecture.